Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry, for uh, giving me the honor of uh, this interview um, for Vitalstoff blog in, in Germany. Um, readers and, and listeners and, and audience of my blog uh, are aware of, uh, of this site promoting lots uh, of uh, news and science on holistic health issues, my, micronutrients, but not only. Um, and uh, that's why we are very, very keen uh, to get someone as eminent as you uh, on this program to discuss um, a few of uh, the issues which are at your heart and ours as well. Um, let me maybe explain uh, to you how this came about. I have been researching uh, um, uh, on the health issues uh, regarding to um, arteriosclerosis, um, high blood pressure and heart failure. And in this um, res respect, I have uh, been recommended your book, The Plant Paradox, uh, which uh, had been a revelation to me. Um, and maybe we could start this interview by you explaining a little bit uh, about your background and how it came about that you as a heart surgeon uh, uh, would write uh, such a fascinating book. Yeah, I... Um... I was a professor and chairman of uh, cardiothoracic surgery at Loma Linda University in Southern California uh, for um, many years. And uh, my partner and I, uh, Leonard Bailey, were famous for um, pioneering infant heart transplant um, back in the 80s and 90s. And um, I'm also famous for inventing a catheter that keeps the heart alive during open heart surgery that's used worldwide. And uh, in uh, the late 1990s, uh, I was sent a gentleman from Miami, Florida, who uh, I call Big Ed in my books. Uh, he was 48 years old, um, very obese, and had uh, what's called inoperable coronary artery disease. He had so many blockages in the coronaries that you couldn't put stents in them and you couldn't do bypasses because there really wasn't any place to put bypasses. And he had gone around the country, as many people do, looking for surgeons or centers to take him on. And uh, everybody who saw him um, rejected him. And I am part of a group of surgeons who are crazy enough to operate on people who no one else will. So he eventually wound up at Loma Linda after about six months of having this diagnosis. And in those six months, he had gone on a diet and he lost about 45 pounds. Now, he was still a huge man. He weighed 265 pounds. And... Uh, he'd gone to a health food store and he st started taking a lot of supplements. And so when I looked at his angiogram, the movie of his heart, uh, from six months earlier, I agreed with all the other people who had seen him that I couldn't help him. And he said, well, you know, here's the deal. I've gone on this diet. I'm taking all these supplements. Maybe I did, you know, something inside my heart. Right. And I said, well, good for you for losing weight, but that's not going to help this. And I know what you did with all those supplements. You made expensive urine, which is what I used to think. And he convinced me to get another angiogram. And uh, when we got a new angiogram, he had cleaned out about 50% of all the blockages in his heart. They were gone. Now, he still had blockages, but now there were places that you could actually do bypasses to. So I didn't know what I know now, so I operated on him, and I actually did a five-vessel bypass. And afterwards, I the researcher in me said, you know, tell me all about this diet, and let me look at those supplements. And I, I had the fortunate opportunity in college at Yale University to have a major, uh, which was a special major in human evolutionary biology. We would call it now epigenomics, mm -hmm. where wow. you would, my thesis was you could take a great ape, change its food supply, change its environment, and prove that you would arrive at a human being. 
And that was my thesis. And I actually defended my thesis and got an honors. But then I, I gave it to my parents and went off to medical school. And so when Big Ed starts talking about his diet, uh, I was shocked that what he was describing that he did was actually what the diet I had described of ancient humans. So right. the interesting thing was I was a very obese individual at that time, uh, despite being a heart surgeon. And I was running 30 miles a week. I was going to the gym an hour every day. I was eating a healthy, low-fat, almost vegetarian diet because Loma Linda is a vegetarian institution. And here I was, a big fat guy with hypertension, with pre-diabetes, with arthritis, and I would operate with migraine headaches and high cholesterol. And I was told this was normal, it was genetic, that my father was the same way and there was nothing I could do about it. Yeah. 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 And, and that's what we're all taught. So... Uh, I got my thesis from my parents, and I started on this program, and then I looked at Big Ed's bag of supplements, and a lot of the supplements that he was taking, I was using down in the laboratory to resuscitate hearts for heart transplant, and to keep them in a bag of ice water for 48 hours, and then make them work again. And I was putting these down the veins and arteries of the heart, and it never occurred to me to swallow these things. So I started swallowing a lot of supplements. And I lost 50 pounds my first year, and I've lost another 20 through the years. And I started my patients on this program. And my patients, their blood pressure went down to normal, their diabetes went away, their arthritis went away. So after about a year of doing this, I actually resigned my position at Loma Linda so that I could form an institute where I would teach people how to eat. Uh, and I'd send them to stores to buy supplements. I didn't sell them because I wanted to see what would happen if I asked them to take a certain supplement and see what would happen on their blood work. And we would send their blood work off to various labs around the country every three months. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. we'd change a food and or change a supplement and then look what happened. And that resulted in my first book, um, Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, about uh, nine years ago. And that became a bestseller. And then a lot of people who had autoimmune diseases started coming to my office. And among the other things I did at Loma Linda, I was a transplant immunologist where we worked to fool the immune system uh, and had a lot of fame of taking pig hearts and putting them in baboons and having the baboon live for at least a month, which is unheard of with a pig heart. Uh, so we started playing with the immune system, and what I found was that there are certain uh, proteins in plants primarily that uh, activate our immune system, and that they're made by the plant because, interestingly enough, plants don't want to be eaten. Uh, it's something that we really don't think about, but uh, these are called lectins. They're part of the defense system of the plant. Plants uh, were on Earth uh, long before animals arrived. And so they had no innate ways of defending themselves. They couldn't run, they couldn't hide, they couldn't fight. But what they had was chemical ability. They're chemists of incredible ability. Uh, they can turn sunlight into matter, and we can't do that yet. So, so they use chemical warfare, biological warfare, to make their predators uh, ill, not thrive, uh, not very fertile, and, or hurt. And the idea is that a predator rapidly learns that it shouldn't eat this particular plant and goes off and tries something else. And so the plant is subject to evolutionary pressures exactly like animals. The plant 
wants to grow, but more importantly, the plant wants its seeds to survive and grow. So a plant that figures out a system to not get eaten or to protect its babies wins evolutionary. And so I started looking at these compounds that are called lectins and the plant paradox is really all about at the at its most basic level, the war between plants and animals. And to learn which plants don't like us and which plants are actually beneficial to us. Right. Um, this has been uh, uh, some issue which I have come across researching for this uh, preparation um, for this interview uh, because Obviously, uh, or maybe astonishingly, you as a person, you have attracted uh, criticism for the uh, hypotheses or for the findings uh, in your book. Um, uh, and one of these goes along the lines of, well, if this all were true, uh, lectins are in, any, in, in every plant, uh, uh, so how come we haven't died yet? But it isn't as easy as that, is it? No, it's really not. Um... One of the things that's interesting is that we, as I talk about in the book, we have defense systems that have evolved uh, against plants, just as plants have evolved their defense system against uh, their predators, animals. And it's it's kind of like the old uh, Cold War era where there, uh, there was eventually detente um, between the West and the East, if you will and a, a balance of power. And for instance, the longer we've been eating a particular plant and its compounds, the longer we've had to evolve bacteria and the rest of our microbiome that actually, if you will, detoxifies these plant compounds or eats them. And the longer our microbiome, it has to educate the immune system of us, that we've been eating these plants for millions of years. We understand this plant. Um, yes, it has lectins, but we don't have to get our immune system all bothered about it. Now, I'll give you a very interesting example that's recently come to light. The Japanese, uh, who eat a lot of seaweed, uh, have evolved bacteria in their microbiome that eat seaweed and thrive on seaweed. But the rest of us uh, have never evolved bacteria that can eat seaweed. And there's, there's a new paper out that seaweed has some very interesting lectins that can potentially uh, cause us to attack our pancreas and cause uh, injury to the beta cell of the pancreas. And it just so happens that the Japanese, because of thousands and thousands of years of eating seaweed, have evolved bacteria that protect them and actually they benefit from the seaweed. But the rest of us may not, don't have that ability yet because we haven't evolved that far. That's, just one, yeah, one new fascinating finding. So, sorry, especially to those of us who, who who like sushi and Japanese food, which yeah. I do. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so, and and it's interesting. The um, many people know that chlorella, which is a popular supplement, we have no ability to digest the cell wall of chlorella, which is an algae, and supplement companies crush the cell wall so that we can actually digest it. But it's, it's again, it's another example. The Japanese can digest chlorella just fine because of the bacteria that they have. So that's one part. The second part is that we know, looking at skeletal data, that humans about 10,000 years ago were, were nearly six feet tall. Uh, males. Uh, women were about 5'5". Five, five. And after the advent of agriculture, when we began eating grains and we began eating beans, all of us shrunk uh, quite dramatically. By 8,000 years ago, uh, we stood about 4'11". And you can, we thought 
uh, that we were little people who then grew bigger. In fact, we were actually quite tall, but with the advent of agriculture, we shrunk. And only recently have we begun to get bigger. And as I talk about in the book, one of the best examples of this in modern history is we've always assumed that Asians uh, were in general small people and that they were genetically small. But in fact, in the last generation, we've seen a tremendous spurt in Asians who have caught up with the West in height and in many cases are, are surpassing us. And that's because up until the last generation, the Asian diet was primarily grains and bean based. And it's only interestingly that the Western diet, which is uh, poor on these sorts of grains and beans have been introduced with more protein-based diet, meat-based diet, that Asians have rapidly increased their size. And it's my contention that's because the lectins that were keeping Asians small have become a smaller part of their diet. It's just another example. Right. It, it would make sense, certainly. Um, You've, you've mentioned agriculture and and how our um, system depends on on uh, uh, or it was affected by agriculture. May I um, take a leap in time uh, to the present day? I know from your book here you also talk about substances, uh, chemicals, agrochemicals such as glyphosate. Um, the European European Union just yesterday has renewed the license for glyphosate to be used in agriculture. And this has been a huge issue also, uh, um, also because um, the industry and, and, and regulators keep saying there is no problem with um, glyphosate uh, for humans. Uh, but uh, you, uh, you, uh, in your book, you um, uh, you revolve uh, why it is a very big problem and why it culminates uh, the problems we get from uh, having um, lectins in our food. Yeah, uh, and this is really one of the the horrible things that's that's happening in Europe. Uh, you Europeans uh, were much smarter than Americans and really resisted uh, glyphosate for, for many years. Uh, but, you know, Bayer um, and Monsanto, um, Monsanto com controls our political system, and it would appear now, unfortunately, that Bayer uh, controls the, the European system, but that's a whole other subject. Um, so what happens is we, we were told and we were taught that glyphosate works by paralyzing a system in plants called the shikimate pathway. And it's the, if you will, the respiratory pathway of plants. And it was originally designed to treat GMO crops, so that GMO crops were resistant to glyphosate and all the other weeds would be killed. And that sounded like a good idea, at least on the surface, uh, because we were assured that humans don't have the shikimate pathway, which we don't, and so glyphosate would not affect us. But what we didn't know, or at least we weren't told, is that bacteria use the shikimate pathway, and so our entire microbiome is affected by glyphosate. And there's increasing evidence, particularly out of uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, MIT, that glyphosate makes our microbiome completely altered. It prevents our microbiome from taking the basic amino acids that make 5-HTP uh, and serotonin, which is our feel-good hormone and prevents us from doing that. It also looks like it affects how we make thyroid hormone. But more importantly, it binds to gluten, which is a lectin, and makes even people who are normally not sensitive to gluten 
far more sensitive to it. So we're we're seeing we now know that glyphosate glyphosate is so common in the United States that it's in mother's breast milk. It's uh, in almost all Americans in fairly high quantities. Uh, it's even in, unfortunately, American wines because the weeds between the rows of vines, unless you raise organically or biodynamically, uh, are sprayed with uh, Roundup glyphosate. And We've just unleashed, um, you know, unintended consequences uh, within America. And it's, it's, it's really disheartening to me to see that, it, you know, it's, it's going to happen in Europe. Um, and if Europeans just have to fight this because uh, you guys you guys were ahead of us in this. And uh, there's still there's still time to stop it. Yeah, um, let's keep our fingers crossed on that, and and we're doing our our, our bit to uh, to succeed here. Um, if I may um, address some of the um, pathologic pathological issues um, of uh, um, lectins, uh, lectin consumption. Um, so we, we we started coming from um, uh, the cardiovascular system. As I said, I was researching um, for a very good um, a friend of mine uh, on this issue, and, and that's how I came about. But from reading your book, the the if I get it right, is lectins bind to sugar molecules. Uh, and for example, we know that um, bladder infections can be treated by mannose. And mannose is a sugar um, molecule. Uh, so would there even be a possibility of a relation between uh, issues with the bladder, even maybe bladder cancer um, and, and lectin consumption? Would it be far-fetched? Uh, no, it's not far-fetched at all. In fact, um, there's um, an, it an interesting paper uh, about lectins and the association with bladder cancer uh, because of this very binding capability. Uh, again, the idea of a plant's defense and using lectins is that lectins are a sticky protein, and these proteins look for certain sugar molecules. And these sugar molecules uh, are in our mouth, believe it or not, mucus, is our primary defense against lectins because it's mucopolysaccharides, multiple sugars. And there's actually a very good paper that I didn't reference in my book that if you eat a tomato, for instance, uh, which has tons of lectins, that the lectins in tomatoes will bind uh, to the sugar receptors in your mouth uh, almost immediately. But getting back to bladder cancer, uh, it would appear that lectins have the ability to bind to the sugar molecules in endothelium and urothelium, which is, um, we know that lectins in peanuts, for instance, can predispose to colon cancer in experimental models. And there's even a paper that I reference that you can take bowel movements from human volunteers who are eating lots of peanuts and then feed them to rats and you will get precancerous colon cancer lesions in the rats from the peanut lectin. And in cardiovascular disease, one of the things that caught my interest very early was that these lectins, particularly wheat germ agglutinin, which is a lectin in the hull of wheat and rye and barley uh, has a preferential binding to sugar molecules on the wall of our blood vessels. And this then sets up an attack on the wall of our blood vessels. And the longer I've been looking at this, the more I'm convinced that this is one of the missing pieces uh, of, of heart disease. And the reason I say that is there are cultures who don't eat uh, heavily lectin-containing foods. And I bring up this fascinating uh, South Pacific island nation of the Kitavans or Kitavans, who have been studied extensively by Stefan Lindeberg uh, from Sweden. 
And these people are fascinating. They live into their mid 90s with really no medical care. They all smoke like fiends and they have no documented heart disease. There's never been a documentation of a heart attack, of angina, of a stroke. They, even though they smoke, they don't have cancer of the lung. And the one thing they do is they really don't eat lectin containing foods. So their primarily starch is taro root. Uh, and they eat a lot of coconut and they eat a smattering of fish and vegetables, but that's primarily their diet. And this, these people have been frustrating to a lot of researchers, including me in the past, because they go against uh, a low carb diet. And, um, I was challenged giving a lecture uh, years ago to explain them. And when I can't explain anything, I have to go back and do more research. Look again is research. And it's very clear that one of the things that differentiates them is this lack of lectins, major lectins in their diet. The other thing that Stefan Lindeberg points out is you, if you do a meta-analysis of the Mediterranean diet, which is a great diet, let's make no mistake about that, that the negative aspects of the Mediterranean diet are cereal grains and beans. And these negative aspects are compensated for by the positive aspects of the Mediterranean diet, which is lots of vegetables and fruits, lots of olive oil, in general, lots of seafood and red wine. And so those positive aspects hide the negative effects of grains and beans. And I'll give you an example that I, I like to use against my critics who, who hold up the Sardinians as one of the longest living people, one of the blue zones, which is true. The Sardinians eat about 10 pieces of bread a day. Um, but the Sardinians have the highest rate of autoimmune disease in all of Europe. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm convinced, and it's well documented, I'm convinced it's actually the negative effect of these grains that uh, are showing themselves because they, they have some of the highest consumption of bread in the world. Right, right. Um, in your book, you, you, you said that um, literally, oh, no, figuratively speaking, plants uh, use defense mechanisms to immobilize uh, their, uh, their predators. Um, uh, what about eyesight? Um, is making people uh, get poor vision also um, connected to this kind of defense mechanism or is, is poor eyesight a completely different um, ballgame? No, I, I think, again, I, people uh, laugh at me when I say that, you know, lectins are probably the major cause of most diseases. And I would have laughed at me if I said this 15 years ago. But if you, if you think, it, think it through from an evolutionary standpoint, lectins' initial target were insects. Uh, insects were their original predator. And the idea of lectins were to bind to a sugar molecule called sialic acid that sits between the communication of one nerve to another. It's how nerve impulse is transmitted. So that if you bound to sialic acid, you couldn't transmit nerve impulses and the insect would be paralyzed. And that's how lectins work on insects. To me, we're just a giant insect. And it may take far longer for us to see the effects of these lectins binding to nerves. Uh, in my first book, I talked about uh, hearing loss. And hearing loss, the nerve is damaged, I think, now by lectin consumption. And if you think about it from a plant, if you couldn't hear a predator sneaking up on you, that would be the end of you. Same way with eyesight. Eyesight, of course, depends on nerve transmission. And uh, there is experimental evidence, at least, that diminished vision 
could be attributed to consuming plant lectins. I certainly see a large number of people with peripheral neuropathy where it's actually caused by lectins. How do I know? Because we take lectins out of their diet and bind lectins uh, and their peripheral neuropathy diminishes. And it's actually quite, quite interesting. There's, a, there's some recent evidence that lectins may work by preventing the absorption of thiamine. And thiamine is vitamin B1, which is critical for nerve function. There's some interesting, intriguing uh, research that's coming out of China that giving a high dose of uh, aqueous form of thiamine called benfotiamine may actually dramatically reverse Alzheimer's. So that's kind of hot off the press and a little aside. But again, the longer I look at this from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, the longer I think that lectins have been a, a major part of things that we just assume. It's like um, in smoking, even the American Cancer Society in the, in the late 1940s and early 1950s said that smoking has no effect on the causation of cancer. And, you know, how could, how could we be so stupid, you know, in, in hindsight? Well, in hindsight, in the 40s and 50s, everybody smoked. And so it was very difficult to pick out the fact that smoking, because everybody smoked, might have an effect on, say, lung cancer or bladder cancer. It was because everybody smoked. And our problem with, I think, lectins is that everybody, in particularly Western society, eats lectins. So it's a little hard to pick those things out. And Everybody in the West has heart disease. Everybody in the West has cancer. There's huge amounts of neuropathy. And as most of us know, we're having an epidemic of dementia. And it's one of the things that I want people to realize is that we've had a pretty good defense system against lectins through the years. But through overuse of antibiotics, through overuse of Roundup, glyphosate, uh, overuse of acid blocking drugs, overuse of NSAIDs, uh, things like ibuprofen, uh, naproxen. These things have really chipped the balance of power so that we're now very exposed in ways we really never have been to the, the power of lectins in plants. These are the seven deadly disruptors you mentioned in your in your book, of course. Um, oh. So we've now been uh, speaking a lot about um, 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 illnesses, diseases, uh, which have uh, a clear um, name to them. Uh, and those uh, um, lectins, when they cause these illnesses, they, they get consumed and ingested via our, our gut. In the gut, um, lectins... Uh, also uh, wreak havoc, but on a, on a, on a different um, level, and that's con connected to uh, autoimmunity um, uh, problems. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, this was, um, this was brought home to me um, by a patient I call Tony in the book who had uh, vitiligo, um, uh, where you lose skin pigmentation. And he was actually one of the first people who actually started my program years ago. And he had a lot of vitiligo. And uh, a few months after he started the program, he, he called me up and he says, I got to show you something. Uh, I'm going to come up to your office. And he lived several hours away. And his vitil vitiligo on his hands had completely resolved. And I said, wow. He, he said, well, you know, why, why is that? And I said, well, uh, you know, my diet's very anti-inflammatory, but I said that, that that's too easy. Um, I'm, you know, let me think about this. So uh, the skin pigment is, is caused by some cells in your skin called melanocytes. 
And melanocytes are actually modified nerve cells, and they migrate to our skin in, in the embryonic stage. And so I said, well, wait a minute, he's been attacking these nerve cells in his skin, and now he's not attacking them, and lectins are the way a plant defends uh, itself against insects by paralyzing them. I wonder if he was attacking his nerve cells because of resemblance to lectins. And it's, it's called molecular mimicry. Uh, Lauren Cordain of the paleo diet fame uh, first used that term, and I think it's very correct. So um, that's what actually started me looking at lectins in autoimmune disease. So what lectins do is lectins, their, their target in the gut is to attach to the cells that line the gut that are called enterocytes. And normally the enterocytes are protected by a generous amount of mucus. And that mucus, if you're eating a very lectin-rich diet, is, is used up in absorbing uh, lectins. So if lectins can attach to the wall of the gut, these gut cells are, you only have a single cell between your, what you swallow and you. And these cells are all held together. There's a game in the United States called Red Rover, Red Rover. And almost every culture has this game. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a German word for it. So uh, what happens is all of these kids cross arms and you form two lines and you run across and you try to break through. So these cells in our gut are all linked together, cross arms. They're called tight junctions. And what happens when a lectin binds to the cell wall, it actually makes a compound called zonulin, which breaks the... Uh, tight junctions. Once those are broken, then lectins can get through the wall of the gut. And right underneath the wall of the gut is our immune system. About 65% of all the white cells in our body line the gut. And it's for an obvious reason. That's basically our border patrol. And we want to know what's coming across. Now, what's fascinating, and this this won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2012. The immune system uh, sees whether a protein is a friend or a foe by what are literally barcode scanners. All proteins have a molecular barcode, just like when we're at the supermarket, we read a barcode to ring up our, our order. And that barcode is read by our immune cells to decide whether it's a protein you recognize or a protein that's foreign, uh, literally like scanning your passport you know, when, when I come into Germany. And it says, oh, yeah, that's Dr. Gundry. Um, he's, he's not on the no-fly list. <laughs> so what happens is that I think and others think that the protein barcode of lectins has been made to look like other proteins in our body. And it's similar enough that if our immune system is activated, as the immune system looks for foreign proteins in our body, and it sees a protein that is not quite right, but it doesn't want to make a mistake, it actually attacks it. So proteins that line our, our uh, nerves, proteins that line our gut, uh, proteins that line our blood vessels. And so we attack it by a case of mistaken identity. And this has been one of the most revelatory things that I have seen, um, that you can actually turn off uh, autoimmune diseases. And we've been doing this in my clinic for over five years now, taking lectins away from people, allowing their gut to seal, and then looking at their autoimmune markers, whether it's anti-nuclear antibody, whether it's rheumatoid factor, uh, we could go on and on, and we can watch these go down to zero. And uh, just this past week, I had a woman with both rheumatoid arthritis and lupus who, after six months, her, our 
her RA markers are gone, her ANA markers are gone. Uh, they're gone. Now, that seems unbelievable. And just this week, a couple days ago on Amazon, uh, a woman wrote in and said, I have extremely high anti-nuclear antibodies, so high that they're unmeasurable. I tried this diet and now my ANA is at barely detectable levels and I've done everything in the world. And isn't this weird? This actually works. And so I didn't pay her to say that. <laughs> no, and it's not weird. It's wonderful. Um, yeah. Considered the the amount of uh, suffering uh, which is connected to those um, diseases, yeah. And we just have to ask, you know, we, we have this epidemic of autoimmune disease. And, you know, when, when I was in medical school, autoimmune diseases were these, you know, unusual, we'd see them, you know, once or twice a year. And now in the United States, we, we may have 60 million women that have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And I mean, it's crazy the amount of autoimmune disease. So there's fundamentally something wrong at our gut wall. And our foods have been changed, particularly in America, and it's soon going to happen in Europe. Um, and so that's, that's what the plant paradox is all about. Yeah, we, we have to come to a close because your schedule is, is very tight and, and uh, um, I want to respect this, of course. But um, as, to, as regards advice which we can give um, our listeners, our audience, um, you, you say that taking lectins out is a way and, and uh, cultures have, have gotten their, their ways of dealing with lectin, for example, fermenting or, right. uh, or soaking has been uh, a way of, of getting rid of lectins. Pressure cooking is something you uh, mention in your book. Here is the question from Germany. Germany is a country which is famous for its potato um, consumption uh, back to the Prussian ages. Uh, is, is it possible to get rid of um, um, lectins from, in potatoes by pressure cooking them? Yes, yeah. Uh, pressure cooking will destroy lectins in, uh, in potatoes. Right. And you, you, we have to remember that uh, potatoes were actually viewed very suspiciously when they were brought uh, from America. In fact, you probably know the story that the French uh, refused to eat potatoes. And the king of France, uh, the, the peasants were quite frankly starving. And uh, he ordered the uh, gardeners to plant potatoes in the royal garden and then uh, station guards uh, around the royal garden to protect the potato crop. Um, and the peasants realized that if the, you know, the, the potatoes were being protected by the royal family, then this must be great stuff. So they actually stole the potatoes from the royal garden. The guards looked the other way. It's actually how potatoes were introduced to uh, France uh, by, a, by a trick from the royal family. Uh, so, yeah, you can pressure cook potatoes, and uh, that makes them per right. perfectly safe. In, in terms of what to uh, take in, what to uh, take out of your diet, one or two quick. Yeah, the, the more you can get, grains, uh, particularly wheat out of the diet, which is very hard to do in Germany, I realize. Uh, if you use traditional methods of raising uh, dough, uh, that is yeast or sourdough, yeast and the sourdough starters actually consume a lot of the lectins. And one of the things I implore people is that for, for centuries, uh, most of our cultures, have been taking the hull off of wheat and using, you know, white bread. And it was only really in the last generation where the idea that whole wheat is better for you. And it, the whole wheat has most of the problems. It has wheat germ gluten and, and most of the lectins. So if, if you're going to eat bread using traditionally raised bread, or traditional sourdough bread is the safest way to do it. Uh, the other thing that I think is important for most of us uh, have very low levels of vitamin D. And I think 
most people should take 5,000 international units of vitamin D3 a day. There's really no such thing as vitamin D toxicity. I've, I've yet to see it. If, if people, I run my vitamin D levels greater than 120 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, I've done that for 10 years yeah. to prove to people yeah. I'm not dead yet. Um, I, I guess I should be, uh, but there is really no such thing. Um, the other thing I think is very missing, particularly in Western diets, is large amounts of omega-3 fats, uh, primarily in the form of fish oil. And it's omega-3s and, and D are really two of the best defense mechanisms for keeping the wall of our gut intact. And so I can't urge people enough to get your vitamin D up and to take a lot of fish oil. Right. That's a very important uh, advice taken from, uh, from an accomplished scholar and, uh, and uh, author of a, of a couple of very good books. Uh, we've just been speaking about the most recent of uh, Dr. Gundry's books called The Plant Paradox. It's going to be out shortly in German. That's right. Yes. Uh, also, uh, the cookbook, the Plant Paradox cookbook, will be released in English in April of this coming year. Uh, we just uh, put it to bed. Uh, it's a beautiful book. And my purpose of that book is to make um, what we call in America comfort food, uh, which is good German food, um, accessible to people who want to follow the Plant Paradox program. So there's lots of foods that people will recognize. There's waffles, there's breads, uh, and I, I hope people will enjoy it as much as I've uh, enjoyed making all the recipes. I can promise it's going to be fun um, um, to, to cook by this, and, and, it's going, and it was fun reading it. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gunry, for this uh, interview. It has been a great, great honor. Thank you very much. All the best to you, and uh, have a very nice day, and stay healthy. Yeah, and thank you. Yeah, you are number one in, in German, so perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. All right.